All right, everyone, welcome to our webinar, Accessibility and Computer Vision. Uh, we are uh, just, we've just opened up the webinar and we'll uh, have a couple minutes where we allow attendees to join and then we'll get things started. All right, everyone, welcome once again to uh, TwimmelFest and to this uh, webinar, Accessibility and Computer Vision. This is a panel discussion exploring future directions in computer vision for describing images and videos for people who are blind. Uh, our moderator for this discussion is Meredith Ringel Morris of Microsoft Research, and I will uh, allow her to introduce the rest of her panelists. Meredith, over to you. Great. Thank you so much for having us today. So um, I'd like to allow each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves in turn. Let's begin with Chansey. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. There's always that moment. Hi, my name is Chansey Fleet. I am an accessibility advocate and uh, tech educator based in New York City. I work for the New York Public Library, where I coordinate technology education with accessibility in mind. And I also run the Dimensions Lab, which provides blind and sighted communities with the means of production, equipment, and mentorship to create tactile graphics and 3D models. And I'm an affiliate in residence at Theta and Society Research Institute, where I do community education, writing, and public speaking at the intersection of cloud-connected accessibility tools and data ethics. Thanks, Chansey. Uh, next, Cynthia, could you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, thanks for having me this afternoon. I am a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University's Human Computer Interaction Institute. And I am an accessibility researcher, so I'm concerned with the ways that um, technology and people with disabilities interact. Um, and some of my interests in this area concern, you know, making sure our processes and tools that, you know, tech workers like designers and developers and researchers use, that those are accessible. And I'm also interested in AI fairness um, concerning people with disabilities of the way that we are represented in data and also the information that we receive that is kind of given to us by AI systems, making sure that that's fair um, and doesn't reproduce harmful bias. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Sina. Hi, everyone. My name is Sina Baram, uh, coming to you from Cary, North Carolina, Research Triangle Park area. Uh, I run a company called Prime Access Consulting, and we do a lot of work in the uh, digital accessibility and inclusive design space, working with researchers and Fortune 500 companies, universities, think tanks, a lot of work in the cultural sector with galleries, libraries, archives and museums and looking at ways of not only uh, remediating and fixing specific accessibility problems, but really making inclusivity and inclusion part of the practice uh, that is within these organizations so we can weave these concepts throughout uh, the entire enterprise and hopefully make it a much more welcoming offering for all audiences. Uh, my background is as a computer scientist. And uh, Venkatesh. Hi everyone, I'm Venkatesh Bhutluri. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington. And my work here aims to make software engineering inclusive to developers who are blind or visually impaired. And my aim is to do this through better programming tools and also improved screen reader interactions so that they're more efficient. Um, outside of research, I spend a lot of my spare time working as a co-founder at iSTEM to make STEM education and opportunities, uh, to improve STEM education and opportunities for people with disabilities. So, yeah. Thank you. And before we dive into the questions, I think uh, our hosts at Twimmel had uh, a few logistical details they wanted to discuss. 
That's correct. I did want to share that this session is being captioned. Uh, if that has not automatically appeared for you at the bottom of the Zoom window, there's a closed caption button where you can adjust uh, the various settings. Uh, the captioning that you're seeing here is machine captioned. Uh, after the session, we will be having this, uh, the machine captions corrected and the video will be published to YouTube with uh, human uh, correct captions. So uh, if you prefer that, you're welcome to check that out as well. Uh, thank you. Thanks, and actually that uh, discussion of the captions and the possible error in the AI captions is a great segue into our focus today, which is around AI technologies, particularly computer vision technologies, um, and how they might impact the lives of people who are blind or visually impaired, uh, including concerns around latent error in those technologies. And so one of the really exciting things I think about today's discussion is that we get to hear uh, the unique perspectives and expertise of our four panelists who are not only experts in technology uh, in general, but also have the lived experience of being users of technology for people who are blind and visually impaired. And so they can combine those dual perspectives in today's discussion. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting several questions to the panelists, but if any of the participants in the live webinar have additional questions they'd like me to ask, uh, please share those in the chat window and I'll try to work those in. Uh, so first, I wanted each of our panelists to briefly describe what technologies uh, they currently use that provide automated image descriptions or that might also rely on human in the loop systems to describe images. Uh, let's start with Venkatesh. Yeah, um, for, so I use a variety of, you know, image captioning accessibility, so, you know, uh, software which do both automated captioning and human in the loop systems. So to start with automated captioning, I use a variety of things like, uh, you know, the image captions that come up in Facebook or uh, the automatic captions that come up in, uh, you know, the office suite, especially in PowerPoint, for example. Um, also seeing AI is a big part of my automatic image captioning use case. Uh, I use AI a lot especially if the ability to actually send pictures from messaging apps makes it super useful in, in certain scenarios. Uh, more recently, I've also been super fascinated about the you know, Im automatic image descriptions that iOS 14 has baked into voiceover. Um, besides from automatic image captioning, I also use services that have a human in the loop to provide image descriptions. Uh, most notably, I use two of these very frequently, which is Ira and Be My Eyes. Ira is a service where there are like professional visual interpreters describing uh, what they can see on your video feed or also connect with you over TeamViewer and describe your screen. Um, uh, Be My Eyes is a volunteer driven system where people can sign up uh, asking for help or people to sign up to be describers and you basically make a call and have it have your camera feed shown in the other person on the other person's screen and you can ask questions and they can describe things to you. Thank you, Meredith. Thanks, Vikitesh. Sina, could you share with us what visual description technologies you currently use? Uh, pretty much everything Venkatesh uh, said, so, uh, and, and in, in the same ways with respect to uh, Be My Eyes, a little bit of exploration with Ira, and then uh, on, on the human in the loop side. It, it might be worth just mentioning when we say human in the loop, uh, what we're referring to is when there is a, a person as part of the process. So either they're live describing, or I would say in certain situations, uh, it might be done after the fact, uh, you know, we're not talking uh, about about that perhaps right now, but you know, in the context of audio description being provided for a video after the fact. But for real time, uh, AI-based recognition, all of the technologies, uh, Ben Kadesh said. I will echo, I've been particularly impressed with iOS 14 baking it in uh, seamlessly into the screen reader, even to the point where you don't have to explicitly request an image description to occur. Uh, there's been some very nice moments uh, and it's not perfect, of course, but there have been some really pleasant moments where uh, something has been posted in an image, 
in a message thread or something along these lines, and the description has been sufficient enough for me to then be able to participate in that conversation more equitably. Thank you. Chansey, are there any uh, additional technologies that you use that haven't already been shared by our other panelists? So I definitely use all those tools that, that Sina and Venkatesh use. And in addition to that, I use Be Specular, which is another human in the loop system where rather than a live audio video conversation, you send off a photo or more than one photo and a question, either using text or voice. And the interesting thing about Be Specular is that multiple answers come back to you. So I use that to kind of build a model in my mind that might be a compilation of the subjective descriptions that I've received so that I can understand and form an opinion about something. So that's particularly good for art, for voca uh, vacation photos, for fashion maybe, um, because so much description is and, and needs to be subjective, but you don't want to just borrow um, someone's opinion as your own. So it's really important to build from a variety of different perspectives. In that same vein, I also use a pretty um, low tech, if you will, human in the loop technology right now, which is protest access. And protest access is not an app. It's just a volunteer collective online, primarily on Twitter, that works to make transcriptions and video description of uh, of multimedia that's related to the protest movements in this country right now. And I find that to be a very beautiful and necessary thing. Often that, that content is very emotionally charged. Sometimes it's hard to watch. Frankly, I'm a little hesitant to call up a Be My Eyes volunteer and ask them to watch something that might be a little triggering. And so it's really great that there's a collective of folks who find that what that work is important to do and are self-selecting to do it. Um, we think a lot about difficult images and even trauma when it comes to content moderation in the mainstream, like for Facebook or Twitter, and that we're having that conversation about labor and tech. We haven't quite made it to have that conversation about the emerging very young field of human in the loop vision, uh, visual interpretation, excuse that my, uh, motorcycle if you can hear it. Um, and I think that that's a conversation that we need to have, that we deserve access and we should have access to any content that we need. But at the same time, when there's a human in a loop, there are human exposures and potentially human traumas being experienced. And that's something that we have to work through as a community. Thanks. Those are really great points about the importance of systems for describing subjective content and potentially sensitive content. Cindy, did you have anything else you wanted to add around uh, visual description tools that you make use of? Yeah, so in ECHO, pretty much everything that everyone else said. So I'll kind of share some context and specific tasks. So a couple of people mentioned Seeing AI, which is a smartphone application produced by Microsoft. And that can help you with kind of a variety of tasks. Um, so using computer vision to read text, maybe on like paper mail um, or maybe uh, on your computer screen <laughs> if it froze or something like that, um, identifying currency, as well as kind of the scene descriptions of images that have been discussed at length. Um, these kind of features and tools have kind of personal implications, like what Sina was mentioning with you know, having moments where you get a little bit of a cue of what's in an image on social media or in a message thread. And they also have professional implications as well. Um, you know, my work, I'm regularly reviewing material and research papers or presentations that have a lot of non-textual content and sometimes um, particularly text uh, and image recognition can be useful in those uh, situations. And yeah, so that's a brief summary. And so uh, you all mentioned that you often use a combination of purely AI driven description technologies, as well as technologies that still rely on uh, human beings to provide visual description. Uh, Chansey mentioned that one of the uh, trade offs uh, around uh, humans versus AI was, for example, whether it's uh, appropriate uh, for humans to uh, review potentially sensitive content. Uh, Sina, do you have any other thoughts on the trade-offs of using fully automated versus uh, partially automated visual description systems? Uh, quite a few. Um, so I think 
I think that's a really critical point to, to consider because it's not only uh, domain specific. So uh, I believe uh, Cynthia mentioned art, uh, and this is really uh, important because in the context of art, if you have a Carrie James Marshall painting, you're, you're going to have a very different context and lensing from a 23-year-old black man out of Baltimore than a 45-year-old white lady in working in Chicago in a museum. And so one of the projects that it might be worth noting here is the Coyote project, uh, where what we it's an open source platform where we're trying to increase the multiplicity of voices within visual description in the cultural sector. And it's a workflow tool that allows for multiple descriptions to be surfaced so that we're not in this, this mindset where we just assume one description is, is sufficient. But then with respect to AI, I think it's really critical to point out that there's wonderful things happening right now. The uh, Progress is, of course, increasing and exponential in its, in its rate of growth, uh, but there's a lot of biases that are built into these uh, systems, and there's a lot of inaccuracies just with respect to performance these days. So when it comes to nuance, I never trust an automated system whatsoever. I, I go in without that expectation. Whereas I think, just from a personal bias perspective, I expect a lot more nuance or a lot more ability to interrogate and ask follow-up questions when it's a human in the loop uh, system. And Chansey, I know uh, in the past I've heard you share several concerns about privacy considerations, both res with respect to human in the loop systems, but also maybe even automated systems in terms of the uh, terms of use of, of whether they're storing or what they might be doing with your photographs or questions about visual content. Can you share more about how your thoughts around privacy uh, impact your choice of services? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. If, if you permit me though, I wanna drop one little breadcrumb regarding the absence of nuance from most computer generated or AI description. There's a researcher and professor in Israel whose name is Lior, L-I-O-R Zamanson, and he did an exhibition called Image May Contain <laughs> that is just a reframing of uh, AI captions from Facebook and other sources of critical historical moments. Um, and it's just fascinating how um, stripped of valence the descriptions are. And so I'd highly recommend that folks check that out if you're into that kind of thing. Total plus one. That suggestion, that sounds <laughs> yeah. fascinating. But, you know, I do worry and this is a broader thing than, than just visual interpretation and computer vision, right? This is the soup that we're all living in. But people with disabilities, blind people, are so eager to get the power of having on-demand access to computer vision and description, just as we're often hungry for new technologies for all kinds of reasons, that we probably aren't going to synthesize the information in the terms of service at all, or even if we look at it or read one of those brief privacy explainers, we are probably going to accept, uh, accept whatever the terms are and proceed. It's uh, a data, it's an asymmetrical power, power relationship. We have the ability to withhold ourselves from using those apps, but if we withhold ourselves, then you know, we don't reap the benefits. We don't have a meaningful negotiation when, with any of the companies that are providing these services. And they're not providing these services out of altruism alone. In the case of Be My Eyes and Ira um, and Seeing AI, they are all nonprofit corporations. Some of them are more extractive of our data than others. I invite you to look at the terms of service for, for Ira and Be My Eyes in particular. Um, and some are careful to do what data pro processing they can locally on phones to, uh, to avoid unnecessary data exposure. But there's no such thing as no exposure. The exposure occurs on a continuum. And I do worry that the most vulnerable folks who have an immediate and pressing need for technology and can only choose from a small number of for-profit uh, providers with questionable data practices are pushed into exposures. For me personally, I'm very careful not to show sensitive material that's personally sensitive to my life to any kind of app that doesn't process things locally on my smartphone or my computer. 
and that means that sometimes I miss out. There's mail that I don't read with the most advanced machine learning technologies because I know that they do processing on the server side. There are questions that I would love to ask that I don't frankly dare to ask because I wouldn't want my data exposed at some future time in a business meeting or at a conference or at a, in a data set. Um, and it's something that I think about every day. And I think as, as is true with the broader culture, um, we need to have a reckoning with the asymmetric uh, nature of, of terms of service and, and privacy policies and renegotiate in favor of the user. Thanks for those comments. Venkatesh, when you were describing the range of technologies you use, you mentioned some uh, such as Facebook, which provides automated image description in the form of just uh, tags applied to an image. Um, you also mentioned some like the office suite of software that provide AI generated captions, but in the form of a, a complete uh, grammatical sentence. And then of course, uh, human in the loop systems that might provide uh, much more rich and detailed descriptions. Can you comment on what you see as the pros and cons of those different uh, fidelities of, of detail and linguistic structure in the output of visual systems? Oh yeah, um, definitely. And yeah, so my use case, first I'd like to talk a little bit about when I use each of these systems because I think that's important to set context for the pros and cons. It depends on what is the prominence of that image for me and where is that image situated, right? Um, so if it's a Facebook image, while ideally I'd like to have a full description, sometimes uh, you know it, the automatic alt text might give me just enough information to think about whether I want to interact with this post or just move on. Um, and for more nuanced tasks, right? Like for example, I want a nice landscape described or for, I want something that is continuously happening and something that might not be as obvious in a picture. I use more human in the loop systems like uh, Ira, for example, um, because I don't believe that we have, reached in, uh, re we have reached a point in automated image captioning that these would convey the nuance or the wow aspect of those images, right? If that's the word. Um, but, you know, synthesizing this to pros and cons, it, one is how much information do I want from the image and what exactly is the image containing, right? Like, I want to echo a little bit on what Chansey said about privacy and that, is that also comes to me in combination with sensitivity of information. So for example, if I get a ready to eat food item from Trader Joe's, I don't know if I trust an AI based solution to give me the preparation instructions, or if I want to look at a container, whether it's microwave safe, I don't feel comfortable trusting an AI based solution. Uh, to tell, give me this information. I'd rather have a, ask a human on whether this particular container is microwave safe because it's a health risk, right? Um, finally, the other thing that comes into play is around uh, conversations, right? Like, I just don't think that we get enough information from image you know, descriptions at all times, which is when I use human in the loop. And one, one of the things that where I think human in the loop solutions are not fully, I'm not fully comfortable using a human in the loop solution is where I want interactions to be, or want the images that I'm looking at to be you know, discrete. Like for example, as Chansey was mentioning, you're not sure if the other person would be comfortable looking at uh, uh, like, and, uh, you know, specific sets of images. Uh, there, we put content warnings at all times. And how do we expose these content warnings to uh, human in the loop systems when you might not know that a particular image might might be corresponding to a particular content warning? So yeah, uh, these are absolutely. Just and it seems also like that presents a bit of bit of a catch twenty two because if there were an AI system that could detect whether there should be a content warning applied to the image, then you know that would maybe solve some of the problems. 
uh, that you're bringing up. So some of the trade-offs you all are mentioning between fully automated and human in the loop systems uh, relate to also the trust in the output of the system. And I think error is a really important topic to discuss because AI based systems will never be completely free of error. And so I was wondering, maybe we can begin with Cindy, if you could describe your experiences of error uh, from automated description technologies, such as types of errors you've encountered, uh, how you knew that the description was erroneous, um, and how you think AI technologies should handle uh, confidence and error, particularly when end users may not be able to verify the output with their own senses. Yeah, thanks for that introduction, Mary. So I uh, can speak to this not only from my personal experience, but I've also done some research in this actually specific area, um, and Meredith helped me um, on one of these projects. Um, so uh, thinking about trust. So I think a lot of us have talked about how we think a lot about you know, when we choose to use what system. And I think that is because a lot of this is kind of our daily life, right? Like we get at least, you know, I get paid to think about this stuff. And we can't make an assumption that that's a conversation that every blind person is having with themselves. And it's even one that I don't have with myself on a regular basis. Like when I'm swiping through posts on Facebook, I am not always thinking like, oh, should I trust this image description? I'm thinking, oh, it said this about this image. That sounds great. Move on, usually. Mm -hmm. um, so how do I know, how do I suspect that something is an error? Well, sometimes there are context clues, right? So when you are swiping through social media, if a user has made some sort of caption and the automated image description is incongruent with that caption, I get a bit of a cue. And sometimes it's, you know, ended up in really funny comment threads like, oh, um, you know, the AI image description said that you're, uh, like, you know, food, your dinner looks like a dog or like something silly, right? And sometimes that's funny. Um, but sometimes there are no clues, right? Like if there's no image description at all, um, and that, those are the cases that kind of particularly worry me are like when the user doesn't know that they should know something, uh, you know, kind of what you don't know that you don't know. Um, and so I think there are a lot of cases where maybe we don't know that something is inaccurate and there's not really a good way um, to do that. Another way that I think about um, trust is not just in terms of treating all information equally, but also thinking about it in the context of what error means. Um, and particularly, I've been thinking about this in the context of describing people's appearance. So if my friend posts a photo of their dinner and you know the AI thinks it's a dog, maybe that's not super a big deal. But if someone's you know gender or appearance is guessed wrong, that can have a really big impact on someone, particularly if they come from a marginalized group um, that is pretty used to being discriminated against based on that characteristic or is pretty used to being misidentified. Um, so I think about you know when we think about trust and error, we can't treat them equally. Maybe there are situations you know, like text where you can, you know, work out because you know, you know, I, I speak English and if a text uh, in an AI recognition of text is a little bit wrong, I can fill in the words that are missing or that are spelled incorrectly. Um, but again, if it's describing someone's appearance or, you know, traditional sacred ceremonies, um, you know, we have to think about like, even if the error rates are low, is it appropriate to get that information wrong? Is it appropriate for AI to describe that based on the risk of what it could mean when it's wrong? how to communicate um, accuracy. Some systems say things like image may contain, which was brought up, um, but I think that there's room for more education and I'm not exactly sure how to do that, like thinking about how to build that into settings. But I think this is a really important topic for you know, how do we explain to a user the limitations of AI, the situations where they might wanna consider it um, and the situations uh, where they you know, might wanna not take it too seriously. Um, so I think it's a balance of kind of educating users more generally and then also thinking about use cases when AI might not even be appropriate because the error um, could have an undue impact on already marginalized people. Thanks. And that makes a lot of sense. A lot of what you're talking about with respect to error uh, sounds like it's related to error in AI systems describing uh, photorealistic images, for example, a person's appearance. And another area where I think error is important to consider is in AI systems 
describing other types of images like uh, diagrams and, and charts. For example, during the COVID pandemic, a lot of important public health information uh, has been shared on social media in inaccessible um, uh, information graphics. Uh, Chansey, in your work at the New York Public Library, is the issue of error in automated descriptions of uh, infographics and data graphics for key information an issue that you encounter? And do you have any uh, thoughts on how systems should better handle those situations? I have encountered that type of roadblock, that kind of barrier kind of relentlessly through the pandemic, both for myself and for library patrons and kind of everybody in the blind community. It is pretty unusual right now for an automated image description tool to do an adequate job of describing a graph or a diagram. For example, I would say iOS 14 has among the best onboard image recognition right now. And it will render a typical COVID statistics chart by saying something like a graph with blue lines. It lets you know that a graph is there to be interrogated. So you could go bring a human into the loop and get interpretation, but it doesn't provide adequate, um, adequate detail on the data that's being portrayed. And I think it's important that folks know that computer vision has not advanced to that point that a diagram or a graph can be interpreted. What's even worse is that oftentimes major news sources whose workers seem to have a service level understanding that alt text needs to be used and needs to be present will write something like graphic charting the seven day average of COVID cases in New York City. It lets you know what the contents of the graphic or the theme of the graphic is, but it doesn't give you the data that you're there for. And when we're grappling with matters of literally life or death, understanding travel restrictions, understanding hot spots. Right now, New York is segmented into kind of orange and red and yellow zones to deal with some hot spots that are popping up. That's really important information. And I think it's important that folks know that um, not only is human in the loop the most reliable way to get access to those graphics and diagrams right now, but the alt text that's provided by um, workers um, at, at those publications is often inadequate. So training for human in the loop needs to be improved at the same time that computer vision continues to advance. Another place, uh, part of life where imagery is very important is in educational settings. And Venkatesh, you mentioned that you're currently a graduate student at the University of Washington. Can you comment on the ways in which error in automated image descriptions of materials that you need for your education uh, has impacted you? Oh yeah, um, so one of the things that I come across frequently is when I'm trying to use a new like tool or a platform or a new IDE, um, some of the instructions are often posted as screenshots or, you know, pictures of code and pictures of the error messages and things like that, which are super inaccessible. Uh, and, and even though you have like automatic image descriptions that don't really give enough nuance around uh, like if this error message, where do I even start to kind of get access to this error message or, or kind of understand this error message that I'm getting? Or even, uh, you know, if I'm encountering an error and if I Google it and if I see screenshots of here's how you fix it and AI based solutions, I don't think do a good job of recognizing complex things like, you know, computer programs or uh, technical content or output from command line arguments like given to, to command line applications and so on. So this is one place where uh, this becomes really like more so of an error. One thing that I try to do sometimes is if you look at Google Chrome, they have an option to, if you press shift F10, which is an equivalent to right click, you get an option to get an image description using Google service. I use this and it's not there, like it doesn't give me information sufficient enough to get started. And it might even convey the wrong information, right? A missing semicolon in a programming language that you're just trying to learn can be quite uh, like misguiding factor. Of course, you can Google, you can search the web more and get more information, but 
on the spot, if you're just looking at that one data point, that becomes even more so an issue. And this, this becomes also an issue if you're working for uh, you know, organizations that use like proprietary tools where you can't just Google on, oh, what's this particular bug that I'm running into, right? Because the tool that you're, that, that's in question is closed source and the documentation probably has screenshots. So these kind of errors become even more uh, prominent in those scenarios where you can't have alternative sources of information. Thanks. And so I think in the past uh, few answers, what we've heard the panelists really emphasize is that uh, errors in automated image descriptions can have a variety of negative impacts, whether it's uh, impacts to someone's uh, self-image and self-esteem from being uh, perhaps misgendered by an AI system in a social media photo, uh, whether it's impacts to public uh, personal safety and health from not being able to consume information graphics, uh, such as related to the COVID pandemic, or in the scenarios Venkatesh shared, uh, those errors in automated image descriptions uh, might impact people's educational or professional uh, attainment, um, for example, through not being able to properly describe uh, screen captures or images of code for someone in the software industry. Uh, Sina, I was wondering if you have thoughts, uh, particularly in your role as an accessibility consultant, on how automated image description technologies could be improved uh, to better meet the needs of uh, end users who are blind. I, I think it's, it's an interesting uh, scenario because it's really a nexus of a lot of different aspects, right? There's not only the technical piece, whether we want to spend time uh, uh, getting into the depths of whether it's a deep belief network and whether, it, you, you know, what kind of system you're using for what type of application. So there's all of, all of those things that are naturally aligned with the business goals of a lot of these large corporations that were talked about earlier. Uh, so that will continue to get better. However, for example, as Cindy and Chancy have pointed out, it will continue to get better aligned against different motives and with different impetuses than uh, are, are helpful for a blind audience. Uh, Google might be very interested in improving image recognition, but for the purposes of enhancing search, not necessarily for enhancing the uh, type of information that Venkatesh can receive in an academic setting. So in terms of recommendations, I think that in addition to the technicals, which honestly to me are frankly the easiest part of this, uh, it has to do also with policy. It has to do with the way that we look at things both strategically and tactically. Tactically, when is the appropriate use of these technologies? And as was said earlier, how do we surface the appropriate uses and the error rates and the level of ambiguity, which right now is frankly hidden. It, some systems don't even say image may contain, they just give a description. And then at the policy level, what can we do in order to actually incorporate equity, not only into training of data sets and things of this nature, but offer avenues for reporting of mistakes and for tailoring to individual preferences. I mean, one thing that we've been assuming throughout this conversation is that the image descriptions that are from these AIs, we've kind of been taken for granted that they're, they're the same. I'll get the same description as Chansey or Cynthia or Venkatesh will. However, I might prefer something different in a particular use case and the ability to indicate preference and then to follow up with any type of interrogation, uh, in interrogation is, is completely uh, absent. And then lastly, I would say, I think it's really important that as we continue using and relying on these tools for vital uh, information, whether it's health care, whether it's health information and safety information, that we do also collaborate with the legislature side of the house to actually in, you know, in, enshrine and codify in our legal systems and frameworks, both the recognition of this asymmetrical power uh, that was talked about earlier, and also the use of AI for marginalized communities and what can be done to align some of these goals to try to make the world a better place. Thanks for those suggestions. And so just to recap some of the highlights, it sounds like you were particularly uh, interested in personalization of AI descriptions, 
whether that's personalization to a user's interests or perhaps also personalization to the context mm -hmm. in which a particular image appears, um, as well as the opportunity for more interactivity, for example, to uh, uh, ask for additional details or to share feedback about the quality of a description. Or to Some offer it, or, or to offer it, right? So if you know it's a graph, and, and you, can, you can then use a different tool or give a hint to the system to take it that last mile. That can sometimes be helpful. Or you know it's, an, it's a family photo and it's on device machine learning, so you give permission. That's, it's okay to do the facial recognition on this one with my contacts because I do want to know which cousin is in the photo. That's a great point, Sina. And I think it also relates to the point that some of this interactivity, for example, in providing additional detail or reporting errors um, is important, not only uh, interactivity for uh, perhaps the blind end user of the technology, mm -hmm. but that people who are sighted should also be uh, responsible for contributing to uh, improving the quality of information from these devices. Uh, Cindy, do you have additional thoughts on uh, features that AI image descriptions should contain? Yeah, so I, I wanted to step back a little bit. So often feedback I give in any of these talks is just about really making sure you're aligned with the community in terms of what the actual problem is that you think AI might be suited to solve. And what I encounter a lot is really well-intended researchers who are identifying a problem that they think might be a challenge in the lives of blind people, um, but that might not really be a challenge. Um, and another thing that I often give advice for is, you know, a lot of our recognition systems really reward novelty, um, and that's fantastic, but there are a lot of basic things that still need a lot of work. Um, so, you know, things like color recognition or even just recognizing text in certain situations like what Venkatesh was talking about, you know, like code bases. Um, there are a lot of really basic daily activities that are not accessible. And so sometimes I, I try to encourage people that there are probably ways you can frame a story to make it look novel, um, but just really focusing on like, what are the community needs? What are these long standing accessibility challenges that may not, you know, look super, super shiny, but are really, really big problems that would be very, very meaningful to the community to solve. Um, where I think this intersects with AI specifically and my concerns around bias, um, I think we've kind of make an assumption that more technology or more automation is always a good solution. And I really want us to make sure that we're continuing to poke holes in that. Like as an example, if AI can describe sensitive content, that may relieve the labor of a human in the loop visual interpreter. But for AI to describe that sensitive content, it has to be trained and it had to be annotated by humans who still had to look at that sensitive content. So I really just wanna make sure we're continuing to poke holes and thinking about throwing technical solutions at things and really thinking about not just the people who are blind, who might be end users um, of those solutions, but of the other people that are impacted and not just the visual interpreters at the end. So like as an example, um, you know, maybe some blind people want certain information from a photo but maybe people who are blind, who are also part of a marginalized group, um, you know, recognize some concerns with that. So that's why, you know, I've been trying to speak to not only people who are blind, but who have a diversity of identities, of races and genders. Um, and so really trying not to block off, you know, as if all blind people are the same. But um, there are people at these intersections of identity who may have really important insights on what might be appropriate for AI to describe. Um, and what may kind of in our current moment imbue uh, harm that, you know, maybe we still need to rely on humans um, that wouldn't scale, you know, misidentification across an image posted all over the internet. Um, so those are just some ideas to think about just to continue interrogating our motivations, whether our problem uh, definitions are aligning with our communities um, and, and whether AI really is the most appropriate solution. Thanks. And Cynthia, I wanted to follow up on one of the comments you made at the beginning of your remarks just now. So you mentioned that you think that current ML uh, work sometimes focuses on the wrong problems, on problems that aren't of high value to people who are blind. And you gave a few examples of uh, 
underexplored problems that are of high value, like color recognition or uh, screenshot and text recognition. Could you give one or two examples of problems that the research community is focusing on that you think are uh, the wrong the wrong problems that aren't uh, solving real end user needs? So I I want to say that every every person is different and has different preferences. Um, and so I tend to take a, a disability positive philosophy in that I am trying to build a world where disability can be a good thing and doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, and so for people who maybe have a different viewpoint, they might not agree with what I'm about to say. But often I meet researchers who are really interested in helping me and other blind people to make our disability less visible. So for example, saying that, oh, because you use a white cane to help you get around, that's a really bad thing. Um, I want to build an AI system that allows you to not ever have to use your cane again. Um, for me, you know, my white cane is a tool of independence and pride and actually keeps me safe and I'm very comfortable using it. It's low tech. If it breaks, I get a new one for like 25 to $40, uh, right? So, so that's an example of where someone might try to make my disability less visible or may assume that I have shame in my technology um, choice to use a, a low tech cane, um, but we're actually, you know, that's not actually a problem. You know, again, there might be some blind people that have different goals, but just assuming right off the bat that disability is something that's shameful and that technology can make it go away, I think it can be a very misplaced goal. Thanks for those comments. And Chansey, I had a question for you uh, also uh, related to your earlier thoughts around uh, privacy. And uh, Cynthia also mentioned issues around how um, you know, sighted and blind people are part of the same ecosystem. So for example, to label uh, training data for sensitive content, people who are sighted might have to be exposed to that content. And so there's trade-offs in harms and benefits that aren't necessarily equal. Uh, trade-offs, of course. And Chansey, I was wondering if you could comment on how um, to weigh the potential uh, benefits, say, of certain AI or human-in-the-loop uh, visual description technologies for an end user who's blind against the potential privacy trade-offs to um, uh, other parties who happen to be in the environment whose oh. personal information might be being uh, captured by those systems? And, and what are those concerns and how do you think that technologists should balance them? So particularly right now, when we know that facial recognition technology in particular, along with gait analysis and all kinds of other things, is being used by by police departments, by ICE, by organizations that don't have the individual interests of marginalized people in mind, to put it, to put it very mildly. At this moment, it feels, um, it feels loaded to bring a camera into a shared space, knowing what I know about visual interpretation technologies and how long data is kept. So for example, Be My Eyes keeps data indefinitely. Ira keeps data for a period of 18 months. Ira did uh, recently give us the ability to opt out either per session on a call or opt out permanently, but they don't have a technical infrastructure for doing that. It's something that has to be done on the agent end and we have to trust their discretion that the button gets pressed. And their terms of use makes it very clear that the product of our interactions, which includes our audio, our video, or the location metadata um, is, is usable to them for any commercial purposes. And other organizations have very similar privacy policies. I think that we have a responsibility to be the stewards of this new technology. Not many, not many groups can go into a public place and start aiming a camera around with impunity. We are being given as blind people kind of a one-time gift. We're give, being given by society the benefit of the doubt to bring cameras into spaces where they're not traditionally welcome, like meetings, like offices, like the homes of our friends, small businesses. I think it's really incumbent on us to do as much as we can to control privacy exposures and also to engage marginalized communities in conversations about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and what safeguards that we're, we're putting in place. For example, I would really like to know what's going on in detail 
at uh, protest, but I would never dream right now of bringing visual interpreter technology into protest because me aiming a camera out at the crowd, not knowing who I'm focusing on and not knowing where that data is necessarily going to go, I think would be an, an unforgivable imposition. And so I think the only way forward where visual interpretation technology can exist in the sensitive spaces where we all sometimes occupy is to renegotiate the terms of engagement and make sure that data retention is limited enough that it accounts for quality assurance and it accounts for allegations of abuse because sometimes unfortunately people do call into these services um, and and behave inappropriately um, but i think data retention needs to stop at that point there's no reason for any interaction to be logged after you know two or three days um, unless there is consent among the interpreter the person receiving the interpretation and anyone else who comes into the frame i think long-term data retention is a mistake and a liability not only is it bad for marginalized groups but it's probably bad long term for our ability to access the goodwill that lets us use visual interpretation technologies in in semi private environments thanks for those comments and and your comments as well as uh, Cynthia's earlier remarks about whether the the ML community is focusing on the right problems, bring up the, the larger issue around the lack of participation uh, by people from marginalized communities in computer science generally and in uh, the development of AI technologies in particular. Um, I was wondering, uh, Venkatesh, maybe you could start by talking about uh, the importance of uh, increased representation of people with disabilities in AI and what can be done to uh, move us toward that goal. I know a lot of your PhD research in particular focuses on uh, making uh, computer programming tools more accessible to people who are visually impaired. Right, thank you, Margaret. So uh, if I understand your question correctly, you're, you're, the question that you're asking me is what do we need to do to increase participation of people with disabilities in? Yeah, I was wondering if you could both speak more to why it's particularly important that we have more people with disabilities involved in creating AI technologies, as well as how we can, uh, as a community, move toward that goal of greater inclusion. Oh yeah, um, thank you for clarifying that. So as for why, right, like it helps think about factors and answer important questions that might pertain to the users who might be using the, you know, the outcomes of the research or tools that we are developing, right? For example, um, if we are trying to say, make machines understand video, what is the training data for this? Is it uh, videos described by, you know, uh, you know, professionals, professional audio describers, where the quality might be more because it's intended for somebody who's not necessarily looking at the video at the same, or is it just a data, you know, that is, that's being collected generally to describe videos, right? Like questions like these can be answered, I think. And also um, many of the things that we talked about, right, over all of these, uh, all, oh, so the discussion that we've had so far, right, around what factors do you think image recognition should have or image description services should provide information about and all these questions I think having more people with disabilities, so if I might uh, you know, scope it down to, in this context, people who are blind or visually impaired, for example, might you know, help answer such questions in very early stages of the work that we are doing, as opposed to thinking about this later, right? For example, if, you know, let's take an example of a user interface design tool, right? Like a user interface basically has visual appeal that you want it to have. So is a user interface tool really accessible if it just makes, you know, all the controls and all the elements that you're placing, it, if it, you know, gives audio feedback about all of those, or is it truly accessible to a person who is blind or visually impaired if it also gives information about whether this adheres to certain, uh, you know, guidelines, design guidelines or visual design guidelines or, you know, other attributes that are beyond just making a tool accessible, right? Um, that being said, uh, I want to talk about 
another aspect, right? Like to, to increase participation, the one important thing is to see if the tools and the pipelines that you're using are accessible. For example, uh, are all the steps of a particular pipeline, say a computer vision pipeline or a machine learning pipeline accessible? Like, can we think about alternative ways of conveying output than printing, you know, using matplotlib to show plots, for example, or other libraries to show plots? Are there more innovative ways that can make these outputs more accessible so that somebody uh, can fully participate in in the uh, you know in every step of the process and in a much stronger professional and technical capacity as well. Thank you. And we're nearing the end of the hour. I wanted to take the time to ask a question that came from an audience member. And Sina, maybe uh, we'll begin with you for this question. Uh, the question is around uh, in. Uh, databases used to train AI systems for image recognition. Earlier, for example, Cynthia mentioned some of the, the concerns around potentially labeling and identifying uh, demographic characteristics such as uh, gender or racial identity. And the question from the audience is, uh, what about uh, should image databases be labeled with aspects of disability status um, as something that an AI system could be trained to recognize? And what are the considerations around um, in what situations that would be acceptable or desirable? Sina, do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's a great question. If I can link it to the previous question as well, I think they're related in a way because this pipelining issue and participation of persons with disabilities within STEM and in this particular case within machine learning helps also address those questions because what we really need in the world is not for me to give some suggestions on that. We need 10,000, 20,000 persons with disabilities working in this space and building consensus around issues like that so that those issues around what goes into that data set are not made by a privileged few and especially these days a privileged few in, in many ways from whether it's gender, race, uh, 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 you know, uh, Fortune 500 status, et cetera. Um, with respect to uh, this idea of when to disclose what, uh, I think you're gonna find a lot of different opinions from, from various folks, which is why I keep coming back to personalization. That question, however, asked about a step beforehand, which was, what do we put in the database? What do we do for annotation? Uh, I think that it is important to identify what is visually apparent in images. Uh, when we're working with institutions on describing photos in an art context, uh, we describe skin color, but we don't describe ethnicity because one can be seen and the other one is, is, is inferred. But even for something like describing skin color, there are a million questions and policies and best practices and style implications and involvement with those communities that needs to go into it to have a comprehension solution in this space. So similarly with identifying disability, first of all, I would say, what does that even mean, right? So, so when I think of a picture or a photo of somebody using a wheelchair, I'm not necessarily interested in identifying disability. Uh, it would be, however, critical in certain contexts to know that that person is using a wheelchair. And in other contexts, it may not be of interest, but I don't want to, I don't want to err on the side of, oh, we shouldn't talk about this because it's difficult, because I think that leads us to implicit um, censorship, and that's not what we want to do. There's this concept that, you know, don't default to white when we talk about visual descriptions in the art world, where a lot of folks will say, well, 98% of the photos in our collection, of our collection are of white people. So we don't say white uh, for, for skin. It's just like, you don't, that's not an accessibility problem. That is an equity and inclusivity problem and an acquisitions problem that you have to solve. So similarly here, I think identify a wheelchair is being used, identify a cane is visible in the photo, just like you would identify that a mailbox is visible in the photo or that a particular brand of car is visible in the photo. But when it comes to identifying disability, uh, I think that gets super, super uh, hairy, super quickly. So I, I would, I would hesitate to, to to go that far. What is visually apparent? Let's just start there. We've already established, I think, well in this discussion that there's a lot of nuance to make up for. 
Thank you so much. And I believe we're out of time uh, for the podcast. So before I hand things back over to the Twimmel hosts, I just wanted to uh, thank once again our panelists, Cynthia Bennett, Chansey Fleet, Sina Baram, and Vengadesh Putluri for taking the time to share uh, their expertise in this discussion today. Um, and you can find all four of them on Twitter uh, if you have follow-up discussion questions um, and to continue this conversation going forward. And I'll hand it back to the Twimmel hosts now. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Meredith. And thank you, uh, Chansey, Sina, Cynthia, and Venkatesh so much for uh, this very informative panel. And thank you all in the audience for joining. Have a wonderful day and enjoy Twimmel Fest. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you.